Well, good morning, Crossing Church. So good to see you today. How are you doing? Great. Hey, I want to welcome all of you that are joining from all of our locations all across these three states. If you're inside or online, we are so absolutely thankful for you as well. And we're in a new series uh, called Handle with Care. Uh, but before we get into that new series, um, I just really want to encourage you, if uh, you didn't uh, have a chance to hear last week's sermon, you need to hear that sermon. And uh, I don't want you to like uh, get online, put in your earbuds and listen to it right now, okay? I'd like for you to listen to me, but uh, I would really like, to, it, was, it was just a brilliant sermon uh, that Clayton delivered uh, last week to, to wrap up Truth Intention. It was amazing to me, and I think that it would really be a blessing to you as well. And we're coming uh, off of uh, uh, RISE Conference. Anybody go to RISE Conference? I heard that was uh, incredible. And uh, all the men that were at Uncommon Conference, do you remember that? Anybody, any men in here? You see this stuff, it wears off, doesn't it? It kind of wears off. Uh, last two weeks, I've been at two Uncommon Conferences. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this was an idea that Clayton had nine years ago, actually ten years ago, and the first one was nine years ago. And it's been a blessing uh, to the men of our church for uh, all of those years. Uh, a couple of years ago, Clayton really wanted to see other churches be able to experience what we experienced and uh, last year, there was one other church uh, in South Carolina that said, we're going to do it. This year, there's been 11 churches uh, all across the country that have been doing that. And I had the privilege of preaching at a couple of those in Washington, Indiana, uh, last uh, weekend. And the weekend before that, I was suffering for Jesus in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But... Uh, uh, other than that, you know, just 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 great, and it was so amazing to watch uh, these men really connect uh, with their Lord in a new way, and that's that's really what I want for you today. I really want you to connect with the Lord in a new way. I want you to have a heart for the Lord. I want to have a heart uh, for the Lord, and that's what this series is about. It's about David. It's about King David, and it's about your heart and how he was a man after God's heart and what is there that we can capture uh, there uh, that we can make our own. And, uh, and I'm really privileged to be able to kick it off both this week and, and next week. Have you ever noticed that God tends to choose the last and the least? to be the ones that become some of the greatest spiritual change agents in history. He just does that. I mean, he doesn't always uh, pick the prom king. He doesn't, uh, you know, always pick the homecoming queen. He picks people that, frankly, you and I wouldn't. Like Abraham, when he was in his 70s. Uh, when God first called him to be the father of a great nation. I mean, that's kind of a silly time to call a guy to be the father of a great nation when he's in his 70s. And he doesn't have his first child till he's in his 90s. He only has two sons, one of them a uh, questionable lineage, yet God chose him. Uh, he also chose Jacob. Uh, Abraham's son Isaac had twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau came out first, was delivered first, and so he was technically the older brother, but they were so different. And, and Jacob was definitely the weaker of the two twin brothers, but God called him to be the father of 12 sons who ended up becoming the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Of those sons... Joseph was the younger and weaker of those brothers. But God chose Joseph to become the change agent to save his family and the entire known world at that time from starvation. And he did that in this convoluted way where he ends up being sold into the slavery of Egypt and, 
and becomes second in command. An incredible story of what God did with someone that would have been marginalized. Moses was 80 years old when God called him out of Midian. He was a forgotten exile. And God chose him to be the deliverer of the nation of Israel. Deborah was a woman in a man's world when God chose her to be the judge over Israel so that he could deliver his people from an army of oppressors. And he used the courage of another woman named Jael to actually take out the captain of the army of this invading army. Gideon was the least and the weakest of his family, and God chose him to deliver the nation of Israel out of the hands of an overwhelming force with only 300 men who had no weapons. Pretty amazing. It's this continual theme that goes through both the Old and the New Testament. And I believe that God does this because he wants to leave no doubt that it was God and only God who was actually doing all of the supernatural work. And maybe God can do that with us. But biblically, I don't think there's any greater example of this than David. David is the eighth and youngest son of his father Jesse, a Hebrew who lived in Bethlehem between 1,000 and 1,100 years before Jesus was born in the same place. So we're talking about something that happened 3,100 years ago. Now, David was just a boy at the time. He's maybe 12 to 15 years old when he was anointed to become the next king of Israel by Samuel. Samuel was this great prophet. He was a priest, and he was the final judge, the 10th judge of the judges of Israel. He was considered the spiritual leader of Israel at that time. And even though that was secretively done... David becomes a personal aide to King Saul. He plays the harp for King Saul because uh, Saul has these bouts of madness. I mean, I'm not anger, but like craziness. And when David plays the harp, it calms him down. He also serves as Saul's armor bearer, the king's armor bearer. And he goes on to become the, this great hero of the nation when he faces down Goliath the Philistine, this giant, this incredible giant in the Valley of Elah. Then he becomes the target of Saul's madness and jealousy because people are really uh, flocking uh, to David, this young man who's done this incredible thing. And so he has to run from Saul's anger. And then Saul later on dies at the hands of an enemy. Then David does become king. And he's this mighty warrior throughout his life, and he, he builds the nation of Israel. It was really tribal until David, and then it becomes a nation under his uh, kingship. And he uses the spoil of both war and wealth to fund the building of the first temple, one of the ancient wonders of the world. David is also a man of incredible contrasts. His highs are very, very high. And his lows are just as extreme. And he serves as a prophet as well as a king. And his songs, because he was a musician, they're preserved in the book of Psalms. Now he wrote or composed half of those Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. And we know that David did about 75 of those Psalms. Do you know that David has more chapters about him in the Bible than anyone else with the exception of Jesus? Fifteen chapters in 1 Samuel, all 24 chapters of 2 Samuel, the first chapter of 1 Kings, and 75 Psalms for 115 chapters. You know, I stand up here, Clayton stands up here, and we'll deliver sermons based on a person in the Bible, had maybe one or two verses. David had 115 chapters. Now, if God chose to put David in that prominently in his Bible, don't you think that we need to spend some time looking over 
David and what he can teach us. Now, the most defining verse about David isn't even in those 115 chapters. It's in a different chapter because he's not actually named in it, even though it is referring to him. And that is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. And this is Samuel speaking, and he's talking to Saul, the king at the time, after uh, Saul has discredited God. And he says, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The apostle Paul reaffirmed that passage in the book of Acts chapter 13 verse 22. When he was writing, he said, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And he will do everything I want him to do. Wow. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be someone after God's own heart? You know what? I think everyone I'm talking to right now, that's listening to me, I think you want that. I do, I really do. I think in your heart you want that. I would want to be a person who was considered someone after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart, that I would raise my children, that they would be after God's own heart. I think we want that. So I don't think you're leaning away right now. I think you're, you're leaning in. And so what is it that we can discover from David's desire for God that can help us to have a better relationship with him. Is it possible that we could actually become people after God's own heart as well? Well, maybe we need to learn a little bit more about David. See, David was known by God before he was ever chosen. He was known. And I want you to know that God knows you. There's not a person I'm talking to that God hasn't chosen. Some of you are thinking, well, maybe, you know, God didn't ever choose me. He, chose. he has chosen every one of us for specific things he wants us to do. How do I know that? The Apostle Paul said that in Ephesians 2.10. He said, for you and I, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That means you're chosen, all right? All of us are chosen to do things, to accomplish things for God. And you are known to God. David was known to God. He was known to God before he was chosen. We know that from those scriptures. And then he was chosen by God. Now I want us to do a deep dive to get a better understanding into David. And there are clues that we can follow biblically. And they're like breadcrumbs. Uh, to get a better understanding of who he actually is. And I have to tell you, I was studying for this, and like a whole new world opened up for me. Like I actually, from last week to this week, I have a completely different uh, understanding of David than I did from last week. And I want to be able to impart some of that to you. Some of you may think, well, you know, I, I've read a lot about David. I, I, I know something about David. Some of you don't know anything about him. But I want you to, to listen to what I have to say because I think it's really going to have an impact on your understanding of David. Many of David's psalms are actually reflections of his personal experiences that are set to rhyme and music, but there's none of them that are more revealing than the 23rd psalm. And the 23rd psalm is where David is reflecting on being a shepherd, right? So uh, Jesse, his father, gave him the responsibility of taking care of the sheep out in the fields. And that's important to understand because shepherding at the time of David was viewed as the lowest of positions. But when David writes Psalm 23, he elevates it. He gives you a completely different understanding of shepherding than what his culture believed. He even refers to God as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's interesting because when if people would have heard that 
3,100 years ago, 3,000 years ago, they would have gone, what? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's almost like a curse to be a shepherd. And you're saying the Lord, the Lord is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. These were the responsibilities that he had as a boy to lead the sheep, to feed the sheep, to find water for the sheep, to protect them, to keep them healthy and to keep them strong. And it's actually a perfect picture of what an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ looks like. Now, where I'm standing about right about right here, where I'm standing, underneath my feet, uh, there uh, is the concrete underneath my feet. I wrote the, the 23rd Psalm. It's still down there. As a matter of fact, on every stage at the crossing, if you go under that stage on the concrete, is written 23rd Psalm. We stand on the 23rd Psalm. Do you know why? Because it is a perfect description of what it means to have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's our mission statement. Isn't it interesting that even though we're a New Testament church, the mission statement comes out of the Old Testament, the 23rd Psalm. And when David wrote the 23rd Psalm, he wrote it in the middle of three Psalms, the 22nd, the 23rd, and the 24th. And actually, what David was writing when he wrote that was prophetic in nature. It's part of this amazing trilogy showing our past, our present, and our future. And I would encourage you to just go back and read. It won't take long to read 22, 23, and 24. And it's not about David's past, present, and future because everything he's writing about was in his future. That's why it's prophetic. But if you place yourself in 22, 23, and 24, you are the meat in the middle of the sandwich. You're like right in the middle of it. If you go to Psalm 22, you know how it begins? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? The actual words that Jesus used a thousand years later when he was dying on the cross. If you read further in Psalm 22, what you'll find out is a, is a perfect detailed description of crucifixion. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They divide my garment and cast lots for my clothing. It's all in Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Jesus was even born. In David's future, he's saying this prophetically. It even, it even describes the resurrection. But you will not leave me in the dust of death, it says later on. But I will, but, but I will see the light of life. Psalm 22, the gospel message. You get to Psalm 23, and it's talking about what life is like, being part of the kingdom of God in this present day, in this age today. Lord's my shepherd, I, I, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leaves me beside still waters. He, he restores my soul, leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our present reality. You get to Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the people, all who dwell in it, is talking about the coming kingdom. When Jesus reigns. This is David. Man, I would love to spend more time on that, but that's for a different sermon. Sorry, back to the story. David's still just a boy. He's working out in his father's field. And Samuel comes to Bethlehem. This, this ancient warrior, prophet, priest guy. Because God told him that he would find the next king there in the household of Jesse. But Samuel couldn't let that be known because the present king, Saul, would see that as a threat and probably have him killed. The Bible says that. So he comes under the reason of a sacrifice. And I want us to read 1 Samuel 16, 5 to 11. Okay? Samuel replied, yes, and because they asked him if he came in peace. He is a warrior. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. 
Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the, I guess, I guess Eliab was, was a good looking dude. I guess he just kind of had that, you know, captain of the football team look. And, and Samuel's like that. <laughs> okay, God, I get you. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, all right, all right. And Jesse called Abinadab. Had him pass in front of Samuel. He's not a liar, but you know he's a Benadad. Come on. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Verse 7 reminds us that David is already known by God for his heart. But David isn't even there. You know, they go through this consecration and sacrifice with the seven sons. David's not even part of it. He's not even invited to it. You notice that? He's like a complete outcast. Like, why is that? You know, I told you before that shepherding is a disgrace at the time, and it was also an extremely dangerous profession. Uh, I know that it was an extremely dangerous profession because later on, when David wants to fight Goliath and he's talking to King Saul, Saul says he's just a boy and he can't, there's no way that he could defeat this giant. And you know what David says? He had already killed a lion and a bear. Wow. Killed a lion and a bear while tending sheep. Here's my question. Why would Jesse allow that danger to be inflicted on his youngest son? If it was that dangerous to tend sheep, why would Jesse pick a boy named David to do that? A, a young teenager rather than one or two or three of his other sons or a son in some hired hands. Why would he do that? Did he want his son to die? Hmm. There are actually indications that he did want his son to die. Now, here's where I was learning this last week. How do I, why would I say a thing like that? Well, shepherding itself. Sheep are predator magnets. And you can see that David has already fought two wild animals at the time that, would, that should have been able to kill him. Why had Jesse put his son in harm's way? Well, that brings me to the second point, and that would be a questionable lineage. In Psalm 51, David is writing that psalm, and it's about his repentance from being in uh, this sinful relationship with Bathsheba, covering it up by having Uriah killed in the battle, and, uh, and then being found out. And in Psalm 51, he said, that this is some of those breadcrumbs, right? He declares these words. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now some of us might think, well, that's just hyperbole. He feels real bad about himself and he's saying that. But I want you to consider that it might be a more literal interpretation because other translations actually say, in sin my mother conceived me. That could be a reference to Jesse having an extramarital marital affair that produced David. That he might have been a half-brother to those other brothers. 
There are actually ancient rabbinical writings that give that same interpretation that I was reading. In Psalm 27.10, David writes these words, Though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Why would he say that? Why would he make reference to his father and his mother forsaking him? You know, his brothers rejected him too. They mocked him. In 1 Samuel 17, 28, when he's going to fight Goliath, it says, when Eliab, remember Eliab, you know, the, the you know, captain of the football team, David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are. Look what he says. And how wicked your heart is. He defined his heart as wicked. But how did God define David's heart? A man after my own heart. Right? Obviously, Eliab doesn't have a good handle on his brother. You came down only to watch the battle. Later on, after Saul decides he's trying to kill David because he's jealous of him, the brothers actually sided with Saul in trying to kill David. Now I want you to look closer at this story in 1 Samuel 16, 11b to 13. Let's read that again. There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. We read this already. He is tending the sheep and Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down. <laughs> Until he arrives. So he sent for him. And had him brought in. He was glowing with the health. And had a fine appearance. And handsome features. Then the Lord said. Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil. And anointed him in the presence. Of his brothers. And from that day on. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went. To Ramah. So Samuel is like the mega guy in ancient Israel. I mean, if Samuel comes to your house, a big deal. And so you know that you know that Jesse would have made this big feast feast for him, right? So here's this big feast, but everybody's not there. David has been left out in the field, and Samuel says nobody's eating anything. Until David comes in here. How do you think it would have felt to be those seven brothers? You kidding me? We got this whole meal ready. Everything's set up. Everything's ready to go. I'm hungry. And and I got to wait for my pipsqueak brother to get here. And somebody has to go and find him. You know, it it wasn't like, you know, they could call him up on the phone and he'd get on his four-wheeler and come back. It would have taken a while. It would have taken a while to send somebody to go find David out in some field somewhere. They couldn't GPS the guy and get him back. Then once he comes back, you know, he's going to, he's been with sheep. You know what I'm saying? So he's going to have to clean up. So they're just sitting there waiting. Everybody's waiting until he gets found. He gets brought back. He cleans up. He walks in. And then what happens? Before anybody sits down, Samuel comes up to David, pulls out this horn of oil. And by the way, there are only three occupations where there's anointing done. And that's prophets, priests, and kings. It's a very selective process. Not anybody gets to be anointed. It's not something that you do. Just, hey, glad you're here. It doesn't happen like that. It's a very, very big deal, especially when you're being anointed by the spiritual leader of the whole country. And this is what happens. David comes in. He's gotten cleaned up. He's ready for a banquet. And, they, and Samuel anoints him. And then they can eat. Read Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Every time I have read Psalm 23, probably the most precious scripture in my heart, I have always thought of all of David's enemies out there. Never thought about his brothers. Never thought about his father. Never thought about his mother. I think some of you might connect to that. I think some of you might be looking back on your life and you're like, you know, I never got a break. Now, I've had, a, I've had, I've had a difficult life up to this point. It's been hard for me. Maybe there's some bitterness in your heart over that because it wasn't your fault. Like it was something that was imposed upon you. I wonder if this passage of Scripture will have a deeper, deeper impact on you and the idea that you can be a person after God's own heart regardless of what's happened in your past. How about that? You see, David had plenty of reason for bitterness. But instead he chose blessings. This is who he was. Even when he was a boy... Even when he was invisible to his family, even when he was rejected by the people that he should have been able to trust in. And you know why? Because a heart for God, a heart after God's heart, is a heart that dwells in gratitude. And that is where David chose to reside, in a heart filled with gratitude, in a heart that was firmly focused on the upper story, regardless of the harshness of the lower story. His lower story was pretty bad, but he didn't cho choose to live there. He kept his eyes lifted up. Matter of fact, that is that a psalm? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Kept his eyes up. It's a heart that refuses to let go of the truth at the end of Psalm 23, 23, 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's what David is going to teach you and me today. First thing he's going to do, he's going to take away all your excuses. And he's going to take away all mine. Because some of you today were dealt a bad hand when it came to your family. Some of you have been abused or you've been mistreated and maybe there are times when you felt like God had abandoned you and you've let your heart get lost in that lower story. But God is greater than the circumstances of your past and he is greater than the circumstances of your present. And God, and only God, is able to remove the bitterness from your heart if you will choose the blessing instead. And Jesus is a constant reminder that you have not been abandoned because he knew your name when he was bleeding and dying alone on that cross. You know that? Some people go, well, Jesus died for the whole world. He died for the world. He had the world on his mind. No, he had you on his mind. Your name, your life, your just like he knew everything about David. He knew his heart before he chose him. He knows yours, and he's chosen you. And even though right now, at this particular moment of your life, you might feel lost in that lower story, let me tell you something. There is not a good shepherd, but a great shepherd there is a great shepherd who goes out searching for that one lost sheep and brings that sheep back home. And he can do that for you today. We're moving to a time of decision. You know, when I read 23, Psalm 23, I wish I could, I wish I could identify with the shepherd. <laughs> you know, pastor of a church, big church, yeah, a lot of people, you know, 11 locations. God? <laughs> I'm 
I'm not impressing him. Sorry, I wish I could identify with the shepherd. But the truth is I identify with the sheep. Sheep are dumb. I mean, have you ever looked at sheep? Like, you ever watched them? Do you, th- <laughs> do you, do you think that sheep are like in the field and they're going... I mean, birds do that, not sheep. You know what sheep do? And, you know, if there's grass, they eat it. And then if there's some more grass, they eat it. They don't look around. Hey, where are all the rest of the sheep? No, they do. Grass. 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 Right? No, no, no. That's how they get lost. They didn't mean to get lost. They didn't wake up that day going, I'm going to get lost today. But they do. (laughs) And then the shepherd has to go out and find them. Because they're dumb. And they smell bad. (laughs) You see that picture of Jesus that they they paint, you know? It's It's a white Jesus, which is totally wrong, you know, with the strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes, like an Aryan Jesus. So dumb. And he's holding the sheep. Have you seen that? Nobody in their right mind would want to hold a sheep. Why? Well, you know, as a field trip, go out and smell one sometime. They stink. They don't clean up well. I don't want to identify as a sheep, but that's what I am. I'm a person who gets lost easily. I don't mean to, but it ends up happening. I get, you know, the, the, it's the next tough to grass and the next tough to grass. And he has to keep, and just because I'm saved, just because I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was eight years old, doesn't mean I don't get lost all the time. Oh, the good shepherd loves his dumb, smelly sheep. And he loves you. And you may be here and you've never, ever come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the great shepherd is walking the aisles. He knows you. He knew you before he called you. And he loves you. Knew your name on the cross and died for you. And he's there for you right now. And I want to invite you, not because I have the right, but because he told me to. Invite you into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ so that Psalm 23 can be descriptive of your life. Because that's what he can do. If you've never made a decision for Jesus, there's going to be somebody right over there by that baptistry. And your eternity will change in a moment. Many of you are here today and you're a lot like me. You'd you'd rather have a higher view of yourself than sheep. But sometimes you have to understand how lost you can get before you're found. And have a moment of clarity or recognition. And I don't know what your circumstance is right now. I don't know what you're fighting with right now. I don't know what you're battling with right now. God does. And he loves you through it. And he won't leave you or forsake you. And I invite you to come up here on these steps, get down on your knees, just pour your heart out to the Lord. You're not going to tell him anything he doesn't already know. But in coming down on, in, in, in that humble position, you're starting to recognize who he is. You're kind of encapsulating that first verse of 23. The Lord is my shepherd. So you know, you're the sheep. I'm the sheep, Lord, you're the shepherd. And to know how much you love me in spite of the fact of who I am, it's pretty amazing. Why don't you do some business with God? I want you to have some time with him and feel 
the wonder and the joy of his presence. Why don't you let him remove the burden? Would you stand with me? In Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, I pray that in this moment we come to you. We'd let down our guard, all of the defense mechanisms, everything that we build up to make other people think that we're more than we actually are. Just be who we are. And although, Father, we are so flawed, we are also your children. And that is enough. So I pray that we would just come to our Father under the blood of our Savior and be changed and renewed. In Jesus' name, amen.